Good morning. I'm Paris Watson with the Office of Disease Prevention, and I would like to welcome you to Medicine Mind the Gap. Today we have Dr. John Ioannidis as our featured speaker. The Medicine Mind the Gap series explores a wide range of issues at the intersection of research, evidence, and clinical practice, especially areas in which conventional wisdom may lead us astray. From the role of advocacy organizations in medical research and policy, to off-label drug use, to the effectiveness of continuing med medical education, the seminar series aims to engage the NIH community in thought-provoking discussions to challenge what we think we know and to think critically about our role in today's research environment. We feel today's lecture fits that description perfectly as Dr. Ioannidis will discuss the empirical evidence for the presence and consequences of some main biases in scientific discovery. He also will discuss solutions for optimizing the efficiency of the biomedical research processes. Dr. Ioannidis is currently the C.F. Renberg Professor in Disease Prevention, Professor of Medicine, and Director of the Stanford Prevention Research Center at Stanford University School of Medicine. He has served as a member of the Executive Board of the Human Genome Epidemiolo Epidemiology, Ep Epidemio Epidemiology Network, President of the Society for Research Synthesis Methodology, editorial board member of 26 leading international journals, and editor-in-chief of the European Journal of Clinical Investigation. He has published books, book chapters, and peer-reviewed papers. He has received several awards, including the European Award for Excellence in Clinical Science in 2007, and has been inducted into the Association of American Physicians and the European Academy of Cancer Sciences. His work combines skills in clinical research methodology and evidence-based medicine with the challenges of current molecular medicine and genomics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Ioannidis. Thank you. Thank you, Paris. Um, it's always a great pleasure to be at NIH, and uh, I would like to thank you for this very kind invitation, and it's a great honor for me to participate as a speaker in the Mind the Gap seminar series. Um, I've talked about biases in research so many times that I'm uh, fully convinced that what I will present to you is definitely highly biased. So um, please feel free to make comments, uh, attack, um, disprove, uh, challenge, what I say, um, including interrupting me if you think that something is completely way off. So we, we try to discover things. We try to, to make um, a difference in science. Uh, we try to find new associations. We find, try to find new treatments. We try to find um, new concepts. And uh, we also try to test them in order to say that we did make it. Uh, but most of the time we're successful. Is that bad news? Well, uh, it may be bad news if we are too successful. And in many fields, we are too successful to be true. So if, if you take uh, epidemiology, for example, um, or uh, typical medical studies that you will see uh, in um, major journal and specialty journals, uh, in a survey of close to 400 studies uh, published in 2004-2005, we found that 89% of them highlighted some statistically significant relative risk. So these studies claimed that they had found something, and typically it was one association or, or two associations. Uh, it, it was something, uh, a very concrete, circumscribed discovery that was being claimed. Now, making that discovery, the question is, what have we discovered? Uh, that's not easy to answer. Because if we take, for example, a discovery that says that I have found a nutrient or a type of diet uh, or some other nutritional variable that is associated with a cancer or cardiovascular disease or mortality or whatever, um, then it's very difficult to say whether we have found the real culprit. Uh, most of the things that we are studying, uh, both at macroscopic and, and uh, uh, medium range and microscopic level, are highly correlated in nature and biology. Uh, this is um, 
what I call a correlation globe. And um, it's um, an analysis from an epidemiological cohort, the Singapore perspective um, uh, cohort. What I have plotted for you is the correlation coefficients for 19 different nutrients, very different nutrients. I mean, th these are things like uh, iron intake and uh, cholesterol and vitamin C and uh, uh, total protein intake and things like that. And if you see a link between these nutrients, this means that uh, there is some significant correlation. And if you see a thick link, that means that it's a stronger correlation compared to a thin link. Almost everything is correlated with everything. So it, when we have made that claim of a discovery, it's very difficult to say what exactly have we found that makes a difference for a major disease or for a treatment response. Here's another field, prognostic medicine, uh, the basis of uh, predictive medicine and personalization. We have thousands of studies that try to identify features, characteristics of patients that make a difference in their outcome. And uh, this is uh, an empirical study that I did uh, with um, uh, Panagiotis Kizas, uh, looking at uh, studies that try to test markers of tumors. So uh, markers that can tell you whether someone is going to live longer or shorter uh, lifespan after having um, a particular malignancy or responding differently to treatment. How many uh, tumor markers do we have that we actually use in practice? Uh, maybe a dozen or something of that sort. How many prognostic tumor marker studies do we have available? Well, we have something in the range of about 30,000. And we have more than 2,000 published every year on top of that. Is it that these studies have failed, that they don't find anything? That's why we just have 12 or so markers that we use. No, they're all successful, and, and here's how successful they are. Um, this is uh, 340 studies that were included in meta-analysis, and this is 1,575 studies that were uh, published in 2005 in a very plain search that's not completely sensitive. All that pie, other than that thin black slice, are statistically significant results. Tumor markers that have significant prognostic ability uh, in the studies that have assessed them. So 91% of that sample and 96% of that sample, they claim statistically significant results for these markers. Well, actually, even that thin slice uh, that's dark, if you take a closer look, it's not non-significant. So this is an analysis of the quote-unquote negative prognostic studies. Um, Many of them claim significance for other non-prognostic analysis. So they have something to say in the paper that is significant. Others would discuss non-significant trends. So p-values of 0.08 or even 0.25 would be claimed to be significant, more or less. Or they would offer apologies, uh, which is a very big category. It means that despite complete lack of any hint of significance, the authors believe that this is a very important marker. Uh, for example, a study had tested 120 uh, associations. None of them were significant, but the conclusion of the abstract was that uh, this is a very important tumor marker, as our previous study has shown. So at, at the end of the day, studies that are admitted to be fully negative are very few. They're about 1.5% in one sample and 1.3% in the other sample, really a tiny minority. Is that a problem? It's not an embarrassment of riches, but um, it may be a problem because most of these statistically significant findings actually are not real at all. They are just null effects that masquerade as associations and effects that appear in statistical testing. They're just false positives. Here's um, some empirical evaluation. Uh, there's tons of such studies currently um, showing in different fields the, the massive advent of false positives in biomedical research. I will just show you one field that has gone through a, a rapid paradigm shift, genetic epidemiology. Until six years ago, we were testing associations one or a few at a time. Is that unusual? No, that's pretty much what we do in most medical fields. We test biologically coherent hypotheses, one at a time or a few at a time. 
That's what we do in most fields. Well, in genetic epidemiology, we had the benefit, the advantage, that we could generate platforms that would be all-inclusive, capture the whole variability in the human genome, or at least very good representation thereof, test millions of variants at the same time concurrently, and see what happens. And here's what happens when we have used these platforms and very large sample sizes in very large consortia to test all these associations that we were probing one at a time based on biological plausibility and biological coherence of our hypothesis in the past. Here's um, different types of diseases and different empirical assessments. Um, each one of them, the investigators have gathered all the gene loci that were proposed to be important in the Canada gene era, and they have assessed them with large-scale evidence in comprehensive platforms. So, for example, for major depressive disorder, there were 57 gene loci that were proposed for smoking, 359 loci for acute coronary syndrome, 70 loci, all of that before the advent of genome-wide association studies, and so forth. And when we run these agnostic but fair massive tests of association, here's how many of these loci survive. 1, 2, 11, 12, 13 associations surviving out of over a thousand claimed to be important and significant and biologically plausible until a few years ago. Now, I'm willing to accept that maybe because of power considerations there's more than just 13. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 30 or 50, but even 50 out of uh, 1,200 is less than 5%. So 95, 97, 99% of what we thought of being important or significant in that field until six years ago is likely to have been false positives. Why research may not be credible? There's practically two reasons. There is bias and there is random error. And usually there's plenty of both in, in different mixes. Here's a map of bias. Um, this is an exercise that I was trying to do for many years, and I was not very successful. I wanted to map all the biases that exist in biomedical research. I had started reading the literature, uh, amassing to about 17 million papers. I was reading a few every night, um, you know, trying to get there. But I met David Chevalerias, a very uh, brilliant physicist from the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and he said, we can do that overnight. Um, so, literally, this is a map of 17 million papers um, with paradigmatic proximity of 235 biases that are discussed in biomedical research in these 17 million papers. So, it's, it's a whole galaxy. Um, at, um, you know, some of these biases are interconnected. If you see them uh, being close to each other, it means that they tend to co-occur or people think about them at the same time in the same papers or in the same bodies of literature. Some of them are never discussed together. It seems that, that some fields are attracted to discuss or think that they're affected by some biases and other fields are thinking that they're affected by other biases. But in, in a way, most of these biases could be influential in very diverse uh, fields. This is not a, a microarray experiment. It's a, a time array experiment for biases and I have plotted the 40 most common biases uh, uh, along that cluster. Um, time is here, and uh, when you see black color, it means that uh, no one is talking about them. No papers are interested in these biases. White, it means that uh, they're being discussed, and uh, you know, uh, bright white means that they're very prominent in the literature. So there are some biases that have attracted most attention. Um, confounding bias or confounding. Uh, clearly, since the mid-1970s, becoming a very common theme to discuss and deal with um, the most common bias to be considered. Does it mean that we acknowledge that there is problem with confounding? Well, the typical discussion of confounding, which is very common, is that you find a statement in the discussion section of a paper saying that uh, confounding is a problem that could affect observational studies. Nevertheless, we have taken care of that because we did X, Y, and Z. So mentioning it does not necessarily mean that we recognize that it could be influential. Selection bias, number two, publication bias has become very prominent and people have started recognizing its importance in the last 10, 15 years 
even though its history goes back to almost half a century, again, many people would mention publication bias uh, in the same fashion as they would mention confounding. So a typical case is that you see a meta-analysis and says in the discussion, um, publication bias may affect meta-analysis. However, we don't think that there's publication bias affecting our results. So th this counts as discussing publication bias. So at least people have thought of that, but it doesn't mean that they have dealt with it. We have the ability to correct ourselves. I, I estimate that I uh, probably make uh, a few thousand, if not millions of mistakes every day, but hopefully I recognize that some of them are wrong and I correct them. How does that happen? I try to replicate, and when we replicate, if something is wrong, and the replication is correct, and it's not biased, it will go away. So this is what has happened, for example, with the Canada Gene Associations. Uh, these are all associations that were proposed and published in major journals with impact factor from 10 to 50. Um, statistically significant in the first study, but as we accumulated more evidence and we re-estimated the effect sizes, they went away. They converged towards the null, an odds ratio of 1, and at the latest update, they were no longer statistically significant. Sometimes we don't have a very clear pattern of um, convergence towards the null. We have what I call a pendulum-like uh, evidence behavior, in which case uh, you see ups and downs in the evidence. So this is a similar plot to the one that I showed you previously. It's dealing with myocardial infarction interventions. The difference is that here you have the relative change in the treatment effect, which means that once you get a new study, you calculate the new effect and you see how much different that new effect, that new summary effect, including the new study, is compared to the old effect without the benefit of that new study. So ideally, you would like to see a flat line at one. And that's what happens much of the time. Um, we see some fluctuation early on, just because of small studies giving results that are a little bit more conservative or uh, more favorable, but eventually things tend to stabilize. But here's two examples, nitrates and magnesium in myocardial infarction, where randomized trials early on showed huge benefits, extremely effective treatments. Then they showed significant benefits, even with large studies, but not as big. Then no benefits, then harms, and some benefits again, then again harms. And the evidence has gone widely fluctuating uh, up and down. Now this behavior of refutation occurs not only in uh, fields that produce tons of studies uh, and you know who cares if I can publish 10,000 studies if 9,000 of them get refuted I still have 1,000 of them that are okay to move forward. How about the creme de la creme of clinical research? If you take the, the most highly cited uh, clinical research papers uh, this is what I have tried to look at in this paper, looking at the 49 most highly cited original clinical research articles from 1990 to 2003, and practically five out of six papers dealing with observational studies were refuted, not replicated, found to be exaggerated within a few years, and about one out of four highly cited, most highly cited randomized trials were also found to be grossly exaggerated or uh, refuted when we had the benefit of, large, of running even better, larger randomized trials. The, the quest for significant results is, is inherent in the process of science. Um, it's not necessarily bad. It's also something that uh, most journals, including all the ones that I'm in the editorial board, are asking for routinely. Uh, so if you take the editorial policies of the 25 most cited journals, they ask routinely for novelty, for importance, and significance. Now, significance does not necessarily mean statistical significance, but there's other manifestations of significance or equivalents of significance in some fields that have no statistical testing, for example. So you can think of molecular biology or chemistry or physics. Uh, uh, you know, most of that doesn't have statistical significance testing. But there's a chase and a, a wish to find something that is important and significant. Only JAMA uh, lists the need to discuss limitations uh, as um, a main criterion for acceptance. And here's some um, uh, phrases. Uh, Verbat himself asks for unusual significance and to raise provocative questions. PNAS asks for exceptional importance. 
uh, European Molecular Biology Organization Journal Astro Managers that deserve urgent publication uh, by chemistry. Astro publication of, uh, actually says that publication of inconclusive results is discouraged. I would argue that almost all scientific results are inconclusive. I mean, if they were conclusive, they would be probably religion or, or dogma. However, you know, uh, one has to see what is discouraged and what is encouraged and not to um, ask for too much. Can we test for how much excess of significance there is in a body of scientific uh, literature or, or experiments or, or published information? So, excess significance has practically three components. There's a component of results that become positive while they should have been negative. Then there is results that are negative that are suppressed. And finally, fake positive results might be created. Um, this is clearly fraud. I think everybody would agree on that. Um, is that common? I don't think it's common. I don't think that um, scientists are particularly highly uh, represented in the circles of, of fraudulent activities. Uh, there's so many other ways to make money or become famous. You know, being a scientist is probably the least uh, likely to, to lead you there uh, of all the routes. Um, results that are negative, that are suppressed, this is the classic publication bias. And uh, people say that this is a major force. I think that some fields may have publication bias and some fields may have a lot of that. But what I will try to show you is that I think that um, this mechanism, the results that become positive while they should have been negative, selective outcome and analysis reporting is likely to be the most um, common mechanism that creates that excessive significance. The common consequence of all these practices is an inflation in the proportion of observed positive results. So if you think about it, all these three mechanisms will create more positive results compared to what one should have in a body of evidence. So here's the three mechanisms, publication bias, selective outcome and analysis reporting, and fabrication bias. Data exist in the first two cases, and no data exist in the third case. Here's some evidence for publication bias. This is from uh, the time I was at NIH. Um, I was in NIID, and uh, I looked at the, the protocols that were sponsored by NIH on um, phase two, three, and four uh, clinical effectiveness trials on HIV infection. The most prestigious organization in the world sponsoring that research, the best scientists in the world conducting it, um, no reason to hide any results, I wish to publish all results as promptly as possible, nevertheless, in, even under ideal circumstances, results from randomized trials that found statistically significant results were published on average two to three years earlier compared to studies that found non-statistically significant results. And the difference was not in the time that these trials took to be completed, but it was after they had been completed. Uh, this is time from completion of follow-up, um, and you see that those that found significant results were published a couple of years earlier than equally well-designed, equally unbiased, equally large, equally informative trials with statistically significant results, sometimes even on the same intervention. Here's another field um, where clearly there is publication bias, um, prognostic research. I've um, been hesitant of running meta-analysis of published data in prognostic research because I've, I've always felt uneasy uh, about how much information is available compared to how much information is really out there. So here's an effort to perform one such meta-analysis. Um, it's uh, looking at TP53 as a prognostic marker for survival in uh, people with head and neck cancer. So TP53 is a clearly important marker that has been studied across very diverse cancer types. And one would expect that there would be lots of studies for head and neck cancer like for any cancer. So we did a literature search and we identified 18 studies that were published and indexed. And uh, they had about 1,400 um, uh, participants uh, with uh, usable information. 
But then we said, let's take a closer look because maybe much of that information is in fine print. So we, we tried to unearth all the papers on head and neck cancer and prognostic markers. And here's another 13 studies that are not indexed, but somewhere in fine print, or if you look carefully at the tables, there's TP53 and its association with survival. And then there's many other studies that clearly have looked at head and neck cancer, survival, and have measured TP53. They don't report whether there is an association or not. We ask the investigators and we get 10 more studies worth of data. And then there's another 23 studies with clearly available data, but the investigators don't get back to us. And then there's another 15 studies that have everything that we want. Uh, they don't mention mortality. They're head and neck cancer. They have TP53. The one thing that they would know about their patients is whether they're alive or dead, I would assume. Again, we cannot get that information. So you can run a meta-analysis with 18 studies, with 31 studies, with 41 studies, with 64 studies, with 79 studies, and who knows how many others we just have been unable to unearth. Maybe there's about 150 of them out there. There's about uh, 300 teams working on prognosis of head and neck cancer. I would assume that TP53 being one of the most prominent markers, the majority of them may have tested them, but maybe just didn't report it. So if, if you run a meta-analysis based on the first lies, which is what most of the meta-analysis in the literature uh, would do, you will find that TP53 is a, a statistically significant predictor of mortality in head and neck cancer. Clearly significant, p-value less than 0 0.001, um, very clear effect. However, if you add the two other slices, it has no effect. It's not significant and no relationship to survival. Here's another empirical evaluation that uh, I did with uh, Orestes Panayotou, and uh, it was published in JAMA a few months ago. Um, I wanted to see in the prognostic literature what's happening in the most influential studies. So we took the most highly cited papers in the prognostic literature. Um, so this is markers, um, biomarkers of um, almost anything you can imagine of, um, papers that have been extremely highly cited. And then we tried to see what happened when we had meta-analysis with many other studies, and what happens if we compare the largest available study on that same biomarker compared to the highly cited uh, study that uh, has attracted most attention. So here's the relative risk in the highly cited study, and here's the relative risk in the largest study. And the diagonal is uh, showing the points where these relative risks are exactly the same, you see that almost all the action is below the diagonal, with a couple exceptions. Uh, almost in all cases, the largest study had found smaller effects compared to the highly cited study. In the majority of cases, actually, the relative risks in the largest study are very close to one. So um, all of these points here uh, are really indistinguishable from one. Uh, so, meaning that there's no information at all to be gained, or very tiny information to be gained. Here's a, another more circumscribed look at uh, cardiovascular medicine, and looking at biomarkers in cardiovascular medicine. That's from a paper that uh, I published last, uh, oh, two weeks ago, with uh, Joanna Dulaki in circulation research. We tried to look at the most popular cardiovascular biomarkers. Uh, popularity here we define based on how many papers have been published on them. So here's the list of these um, uh, most popular biomarkers. Um, and you can see that they have tens of thousands of uh, papers in PubMed. Um, some of them have a strong cardiovascular focus. Uh, on average, uh, we are talking about 30% of the literature being here uh, about cardiovascular disease. Even when you limit to cardiovascular focus, there's more than 6,500 papers for each one of them. There's big players here like homocysteine, CRP, triglycerides, uh, uric acid as predictors of cardiovascular events. And here's a synopsis of the effect sizes of uh, these most popular biomarkers out of uh, meta-analysis of many studies. And these are unadjusted relative risks, these are adjusted relative risks. Many of them, the effects are null. 
or indistinguishable from null. Some of them, they have effects that are not null, but, but still not large. We're talking about relative risks of 1.3, occasionally 1.4 at best, per one standard deviation. Um, you know, in, in terms of the information conferred, you would expect that if you put them on a predictive model on top of, let's say, Framingham score, if you get an improvement of AUC more than 0.01, .01, it's most likely that something was wrong in the calculations. So, um, so the, the, there's hundreds of thousands of studies. There's, there's about 200,000 studies on these biomarkers to come up with three or four tenues biomarkers with tiny or modest effects at, at best. Can we find, with some statistical testing, that there are hints of excess significance bias? There are some thoughts about it, um, and there are some applications. So until now, People have emphasized the process of publication bias, even though I think that other selection forces may be more prominent, and have used modeling with asymmetry methods, what you may have seen as final plot-based methods, trying to identify hints of small study effects. What do small study effects mean is that small studies give different results from large studies. And there is that concept that large studies would be more reliable. Well, not necessarily. I can think of many situations where that might not be the case, but generally it makes sense that if you run a better, larger study, you may get better results, more accurate results. So let's try to do that. Uh, people have tried to do that. They have looked at one meta-analysis at a time. And um, here's a few examples. This is um, from a paper in, uh, in BMJ on uh, whether acupuncture works in treating stroke. Uh, there's um, 49 trials, and uh, this is um, on that side. Trials favor acupuncture on that side, they favor control, and this is how big the trial is. It's uh, the number of participants. Not a very good statistical measure, but it's, it's a surrogate of, of size and weight. And you can clearly see that um, the largest studies are very close to the null, and the small studies are all over the place, but just on one side of that vertical line. That's not good news. It means that the, the small studies have managed either to move to the right or some studies here have disappeared. I'm not going to tell you what has happened because I don't know. I don't know these studies have, that have disappeared. If I knew about them, I would have plotted them. I would have included them in the calculation. So two options. Um, studies have disappeared or studies have shifted to the right. Why this has not shifted? Well, it's too big to shift. If it's a large study, many people know about it. The calculations are very robust. You can play with the numbers, but it's not going to move a lot. Or a third alternative, all of these studies here are fake. Ugh. I don't buy that. I think that's extremely unlikely. So here's a classic funnel plot. Um, you can see a funnel here. How about here? Well, the authors say, final plot for publication bias in relation to changes in lumbar bone density. Note the hollow area where studies with smaller sample size and treatment effects distributed around the null value are missing. Um, hmm. Is that the hole? Or maybe here? Or here? I don't know. I mean, you know, these bias tests can become more biased than what they're trying to find bias on. Um, here's another example. Is there a funnel here? Is it symmetric? I don't know. There's not that many studies. There's um, three, six, seven, um, ten studies. I think there's more action on that side, but maybe not. I really don't know. But here's the interpretation. Final plot of studies of NSAID use in Alzheimer's disease, da da da, um, represents null. Visual inspection of final plot does not indicate publication bias. So we've plotted that and we're happy there's no indication of publication bias. We're happy we can say that um, NSAIDs do something for Alzheimer's. I don't remember. They cause Alzheimer's, they cure Alzheimer's. Doesn't make a big difference. Um, 
So here's a very complicated paper, and I, I used a bad slide to convince you that it's complicated. Uh, but it was a great honor to work with lots of methodologies. I'm a co-author on that with Jonathan Stern and many other um, precious colleagues. We tried to create an algorithm on how you can use these bias tests and whether there are limitations, where they can be applied, whether, whether there's strong points and weak points. Uh, it's, I think, very useful uh, if you want to spend some time reading it in, in BMJ. Um, but the, the problem is that most of these tests cannot be applied to single studies or even to single meta-analysis. So here's an empirical evaluation of 7,000 meta-analysis, 6873, from the Cochrane Library of Systematic Reviews, um, where I have uh, tried to see whether we have enough studies, more than 10, uh, with different sample sizes, different weights, different variances, to be statistically more precise, um, with at least one finding significant results and uh, with no um, uh, significant heterogeneity, because you actually need all of that in order to make sure that you apply these tests correctly. And when you try that, you're left with only about 5% of these studies fulfilling these criteria that you can apply these tests and start saying something about whether there is small study effects and therefore potentially also publication bias. So what could we do? Um, well, we have to acknowledge that we're dealing with ruins much of the time. Um, Meta-analysis is not to blame if the evidence is in ruin. Uh, you can't blame the photographer for the status of this uh, ancient temple. But maybe what you could do is try to examine many ruins at the same time. So if, if you examine many ruins, um, like uh, you know, the Greek or the US economy or uh, um, you start seeing some concepts. Why are things happening like that? And, and, and why are some themes uh, repeated again and again? So if you have lots of studies, if you have hundreds and thousands of studies, you can start modeling the selection process. And um, how could you model that? Well, following uh, the pressure to publish significant results, one could say that um, if you found a non-significant result and you are unlucky to be in the central mass of studies, then you have a filter that will lead you to non-publish or maybe some of your results will be drafted in a way to show that they are significant. So you apply that filter in thousands of studies and you get that new distribution that would be, have been the null. Um, what you would have expected, and this is when you apply that selection filter. What kind of filters would people apply? So um, as um, uh, Neil Young uh, would say, with whom I, I wrote a paper a few years ago in, in PLOS Medicine, um, people like to be winners, and when they're winners, they suffer from the winner's curse, meaning that what they have found is likely to be exaggerated, okay, or compared to the, the true effect. How would that show in, in a plot of results? Here's one meta-analysis, um, uh, an innocuous meta-analysis in a nice journal, European Psychiatry, dealing with a topic that I have no clue about. Um, it's about the differences in brain volumes in uh, vermal lobules 6 to 8, don't ask me about neuroanatomy, but I think that they're somewhere in the cerebellum, not in the stomach for sure. Um, and they're testing whether the volume of that area in the cerebellum is related to uh, the chances of having autism. So it's a case control study, people with autism and people without. Uh, and is there a difference? So here's the studies, along with their confidence intervals, and here's the summary effect. The summary effect, it's given as a, in a standardized fashion. It's um, a standardized mean difference of minus 0 0.27. It is significant. It would be a shame not to be significant. Um, but it's small. You know, a, a 0 0.27 is an effect that's uh, small to modest at best. So I'm willing to accept that effect. I take it for granted. I, say that what I see, all the studies are correct, 
I take them at face value. Nothing is wrong with their results. There's no inflation, no winner's curse, no problem, no bias. And I believe the summary effect. Let me go back to the individual studies. If that effect is correct, based on the sample size of each one of these studies, what would be the chances, statistically speaking, the power of each study to find a significant effect of that magnitude? Now let me give you another piece. These studies are very small. Typically we're talking about 20 cases and 20 controls. The power of each one of these studies to have found a significant result is in the range of 5%, 10%, occasionally a little bit higher than that. How many of them have found a significant result? Here's one, two, three, four, five. Almost half of them have found a significant result on their own with 20 or 30 cases and 20 or 30 controls. Well, they had no chance of finding that. Is there something wrong here? Even if that result is correct, these studies cannot be correct. There's too many significant results. Well, let's take it to a next step. How about if we were to look at many studies, not just for the volumes of that particular cerebellar area, but for many other volumes in different fields of the brain for different types of conditions? Because this is a common field that is run by the same teams, the same principles of research, design, experimentation, and reporting. Keep that in mind. Here's another example that maybe there's too many significant results. Uh, that's from a paper that I published uh, uh, last month in uh, JNCI with uh, Vish Nair from Stanford. We tried to accumulate the evidence on microRNA uh, in terms of their ability to uh, predict outcomes in human cancers. So I'm showing you here all the statistically significant results for different types of tumors um, and for uh, different types of microRNAs. They are not all the studies that have been done. There's a few more that are non-significant, but really very few. The majority of these studies have found significant results. Take a look at the confidence intervals. The large majority of them are very close to a hazard ratio of one, the null. They are scratching the null, but don't touch it. Hmm? They are significant, but they are just significant. Let me be mean. Each of these studies can be analyzed in many different ways. All of them legitimate. You can adjust or non-adjust for age, gender, uh, tumor size, histology, grade, other microRNAs, other variants, other molecular markers. That would make the effect fluctuate. Isn't it curious that that effect fluctuates just to pass that bar? And once it passes, it's okay. Let's go to clinical medicine. Steroids. Steroids for, for what? For everything. Can you think of a disease that you cannot think of using steroids? There's about 2,000 randomized trials of steroids that have been published. And um, clearly, there's indications for steroids. But what I'm focusing here is mortality. Do steroids save lives? I'm not talking about whether they help exacerbations of asthma or other things, but do they save lives for different conditions? Hundreds of studies that have been done, and many of them claim significant results. Well, let's take a look at the largest of these studies. There's 14 studies that I have plotted here for very different types of outcomes from sepsis, uh, to uh, cancer, to myocardial infarction, head injury, breast cancer, bacterial meningitis, and so forth. And if you go back to read these papers, nine of the 14 of these articles, they claim that they have found a significant difference for steroids. Even if you're not very familiar with meta-analysis, you can see that if the confidence interval crosses on both sides of one, that's not a statistically significant result. Where is nine statistically significant results there? 
I need to put my glasses, but I think there's one here, isn't it? Yes. Head injury. Well, unfortunately, it's on the wrong side. Head injury, if you give steroids, you increase mortality, statistically significant, clearly. Um, so there's another eight that claim actually significant benefits with steroids. None of them is significant when you look at all the data, all patients randomized according to intention to treat, analyzed. However, if you go back to the papers, you will see that each one of these eight, they have an analysis that shows that for that subset, in that setting, in that subgroup, there is significant benefit. If you take myocardial infarction, for example, that paper, which the overall results clearly show no significant benefit, they say that steroids decrease mortality significantly within 7 to 24 hours and then from one month to three months. I may not be exact about the exact timing thresholds, but that means that steroids are not good for you, but if you survive for seven hours, then for the next 17 hours you will do great, and then you need to live for the other two months, and you know, after that for another three months you will do superb with steroids. How likely is that to be true? I mean, th this is a very clear example of how selective analysis could really create the desirable the significant result. But there's others that may be not as easy to, to decipher. Keeping uh, an eye on clinical medicine, uh, this is uh, an empirical evaluation that I just finished with uh, um, Nazmuz and Julian Sakib at Stanford. Uh, we took studies, randomized controlled studies, published in the most prestigious uh, medical journals, published in 2009. And we tried to see how many of them had adjusted and unadjusted analysis for their primary outcome. So here's the results. And you see that there are 17 that are statistically significant, both with unadjusted and with adjusted analysis. There are 16 that are non-significant with both. And then there are seven, which is uh, not an negligible proportion, that are significant only with one of the two analyses. So the, the conclusion and the interpretation could be different, especially if you, if you take that significance very literally as being the key for the interpretation of the results for several of these randomized trials. Now, for the other studies that only report unadjusted results or only report adjusted results, I have no clue what the unadjusted and adjusted reciprocal results would be and why people only report one of the two. Is it only um, some clear threshold of significance that is important? Not necessarily. So uh, maybe a naive way would be to... to say that uh, we are all seeking to pass a p-value of 0 0.05 and then we're happy. But actually there's many other reasons why the attraction of passing a 0 0.05 is not necessarily perfect. So sometimes other thresholds may be more attractive in some disciplines. In some disciplines people may be used to a p-value of 0 0.001. Uh, or in genome-wide association studies, now we are used to a 10 to the minus 8. So people will do everything. They will change outcomes, phenotypes, definitions, analysis, provided that you pass a p-value of 10 to the minus 8. Investigators may reach close to the threshold, may get a p-value of 0 0.07, and then verbally make the leap that these are significant results. Um, some people may use some multiplicity corrections. You may have biased analysis that are overkill. Uh, so e even though what you want to get is a 0 0.04, you just put too much bias and you get a 0 0.0004. I mean, you just put a high dose of, of overkill bias. Men also may standardize results, which means that you may get more conservative p-values than the primary reported data. Chance could play a role or it could be a combination of the above. So it, it's not necessary that the p-value of 0 0.05 would be a perfect threshold. I don't want to torture you with math, um, but here's how you can apply the concept of testing whether the observed number of significant results based on a specific threshold is more compared to the expected based on the power that each one of these studies has if you assume that the effect that you see in the meta-analysis is correct, you know, plausible effect. Um, it's easy to do, trust me. And here's what you get when you apply that to 10 meta-analyses of neuroleptic treatment. 
These are uh, about 200 studies of neuroleptics versus placebo. Most of them small studies, many of them having reported significant results on their own, even though they're very small and their power is small to find a significant result on their own. So here I have plotted the significance chasing p-value as a function of the alpha level, the significance where the power is estimated. And you see that there's a dip here. There's action happening around the area of a p-value of 0.05. In simple words, there's too many studies that have p-values less than 0.05 um, or less than 0.04, less than 0.03, compared to what you would expect even if the results were OK in terms of the summary effect of the meta-analysis. Here's the same example that I showed you with the, 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 the vermolobules volumes, but showing you many meta-analyses on brain volumes. This is uh, close to 500 studies in about 50 different meta-analyses looking at differences in brain volumes of specific brain areas in people with mental health disorders versus controls. And, uh, these are the effect sizes from the meta-analysis, most of them pretty small. So you see there's a couple of uh, 0.5 and 0.6. I think there's 1.77, but most of them are 0 0.09, 0 0.18, 0 0.27, 0 0.39. Small to modest effects. Tiny studies. You see here that with 15 studies, we just have 250 cases and 300 controls. So on average, about 15 cases and 20 controls. And this is the excess significance testing. Um, observed positive results, expected positive results, clearly far fewer compared to the observed. And uh, this is uh, plotting the excess of observed, so observed minus expected, as a function of the between data set heterogeneity, how different are the results across the studies that are combined in a meta-analysis. Clearly, Excess significance is more common in meta-analysis that have lots of heterogeneity. Lots of heterogeneity. So possibly a big portion of the heterogeneity is generated by these biases. If some of these effects are shifting in one direction, along with their shift, they will cause heterogeneity. You will pick it as statistical heterogeneity. You may think that there's biological heterogeneity behind it but it's actually mostly biased that that heterogeneity captures. Could non-significant results be attractive? In some cases, they may be very attractive. And uh, here's one situation that I have coined the term Proteus phenomenon. Um, Proteus was a god uh, in uh, Greek mythology. He was an oracle, and his main characteristic is that he would change forms very rapidly. He would change from fire to water. So he was very evasive, and people were trying to get hold of him to ask him important questions like, is my scientific discovery correct? But unfortunately, he was not easy to get hold of. And um, this is what we see sometimes. We see a first study reporting and publishing a highly statistically significant and strong effect. And then within one year or less, we see another study that refutes that, finds no effect, uh, definitely non-significant effect, and the estimate is the most conservative ever to be seen. The following studies fall somewhere in the middle. So this was too good to be true, this was too bad to be true, and maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. That second study, or that study that follows within a short period of time, that tries to kill the discovery is the Proteus effect. Uh, there's attraction to publish a highly negative, as conclusively negative result as possible, if ever there can be a conclusive negative result. Of course, there cannot be. Um, just because there has been a positive result that has appeared. So um, maybe some of these results, I would argue, are already available. They're just sitting in some lab notes. And nobody wants to publish them because they're negative. But then you see that someone else has published on that same theme in Nature or Science or Journal of Clinical Investigation. And now your negative result acquires a lot of importance 
a high value because you can publish it in a prestigious journal claiming that, no, I couldn't replicate what has been done. Let's try to put all of that together. Um, this is um, a little bit more complex modeling that I've tried to do with um, Thomas Pfeiffer from um, uh, the program in evolutionary dynamics at Harvard, where we try to put all these forces together. We have a force in favor of significant results, and on top of that, we may have Proteus phenomenon, and then you have to decide what will happen in the subsequent studies that, that appear later on. What are the selection forces that guide their publication or guide the shaping of their effect sizes? Um, so there's different models. There's um, model one, two, Proteus model with uh, uh, different types of replication effects. And this is what it looks like. Um, again, I don't want to run through the math, but the conclusion is that the Proteus model is the best fitting, meaning that when you look, in that case, in about 1,400 studies of Alzheimer's disease genetics, there are some discernible forces that drive their selection for publication. Early studies need to find very significant results, otherwise forget it. Once these are out, you have produce phenomenon for a while. You have an opportunity window to publish a negative result. Once that opportunity window is gone, then again you need to find a significant result in order to publish. And it's not going to be so strong a filter as for the early significant results. A complex model, it may not be true. Yeah, I, I think that we should try to replicate it. But I think that it's possible that some of these forces are operating uh, concurrently in different scientific fields. So um, I think I have depressed everybody. But the good thing about this lecture is that it runs for two hours. I don't want to run for two hours because I think that there should be plenty of time for questions, comments, and, and refutations of what I have tried to describe. But I want to spend uh, about 15 minutes on potential solutions. And here's some solutions on what to do uh, for these problems. First of all, probably we have to learn to live with small or even tiny effects. Um, this is uh, from a paper that I published uh, recently uh, in IJE with uh, George Siontis. Um, we try to isolate tiny effects. Tiny effects are defined as those that have relative risks less than 1.05 or bigger than 0 0.95. They're becoming common in the literature. And they appear, they have made an influx into major prestigious journals. You see the best journals publishing effect sizes relative risks of 1.03. Statistically significant, but 1.03. As we go with larger and more unbiased studies, I think that more and more of the effects that we're chasing will be tiny. Tiny effects are not bad. That's what they are. It may be that most of biology is tiny effects. I don't know. We just need more evidence. But I wouldn't be surprised if most of epidemiology, most of biology is just hundreds thousands, tens of thousands of tiny effects, a possibility. Adjusting effects downwards. So you read the most prestigious medical journal. I don't know what you want that to be, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Lancet. And you read about a randomized controlled trial, the best experimental design that has published a statistically significant relative risk of 1.8. It's a study of 500 patients. However, there's only 30 people who had the event of interest, died, disease progression, remittance, or, or whatever. So the effective sample size is really these 20 or 30 people who had the event. Is that 1.8 uh, likely to be true? And if not, what would be likely to be true? Here's an empirical evaluation looking at meta-analysis that had studies from these major journals. And they also had studies from other um, journals on the same topic, same intervention. And comparing the effect sizes of the studies published in the major journals versus the studies published in the lower impact factor journals. On average, there's an inflation of about 1.8. So if you see an effect size of 1.8, the most likely that there's no effect. If you see a 1.5, the most likely is that it's harmful. Well, 
obviously lots of variability. So unfortunately, you cannot apply that rule. You can apply it if you have 100 studies published in New England Journal of Medicine. You can say that 60 of them are wrong. But you cannot pinpoint which one of them is wrong, unfortunately. Getting used to estimating credibility. Um, hmm. I think that it would be nice if we can compromise and um, say, OK, can we translate these levels of statistical significance to some level of credibility? 2%, 5%, 10%, 40%. So I have done that for meta-analysis in this plot. And um, I'm showing you how the credibility of these meta-analysis in 2005 changed in 2010. Some of them became more credible as we accumulated more information from more trials. Others became a little bit less credible. On average, they tended to become more credible, but not all of them, clearly. Um, why are these two plots different? Well, they're different because here you start from someone who is a skeptic and doesn't want to believe a lot in significant results, even when they come from randomized trials and from meta-analysis. So you can have a skeptic prior, or you can be an optimist and believe in these results. The results, obviously, are not going to be the same. And there will be some debate. And this is unavoidable. Interpretation will always have debate. But at least you can estimate how big is the difference that separates a skeptic from an optimist and what kind of credibility are we talking about. And then take that to the next level. With 20% credibility, is that something that I would like to use to my patients? Or do I want 50%? Do I want 80%? Am I happy just with 10%? Large-scale collaboration. I think that this is very important. Um, many fields have recognized that this is the way to move forward. Human genome epidemiology was not different than brain volume studies 10 years ago. We were talking about studies of 30 cases and 30 controls, thousands of them being published. Now, the typical paradigm is studies of 30,000 cases and 30,000 controls. And when we do that, of course, we get fewer signals that are robustly replicated, but at least we know that when they do get replicated, they're very, very likely to be true. So here's uh, an example from uh, the Consortium on Tobacco uh, Associations, uh, smoking behavior. Uh, few peaks in the Manhattan plots, but at least we know that they're, they're there. Some of these p-values are 10 to the minus 150, uh, I think. Minus 350 is something that I saw recently in a paper. 99.9999999% um, likely to be true. Can you do that in other fields? Can you do it in non-genetic epidemiology? Of course. It's just the same principle. Instead of testing one association at a time, you test everything that you have in the same analysis. So here's a paper that... Um, uh, I worked with uh, Shirag Patel from Stanford, and we just published that in the National Journal of Epidemiology. Um, we took about 400 different exposures, and we tried to see if they're associated with triglyceride levels, uh, LDL, and HDL. Each one of these points could have been a separate paper, if you think about it. It would be a typical epidemiological paper testing one environmental pollutant or vitamin or toxin or whatever in its relationship to lipids. Well, we thought it would be better to just run all the analysis and adjust for the multiplicity of comparisons and also for false discovery rate and see which ones come to the top and seem to be the most likely to be useful to consider in subsequent replications. Um, and also, whether they're correlated or not. These are the associations that passed uh, a false discovery rate threshold. And I'm showing you here a hit plot with uh, dark red and dark blue being suggestive of strong correlation. So these are not independent factors, as I mentioned up front in my talk. But at least we can start seeing what are the most promising clusters of potential associations. A few of them might be causative. A few of them might be useful. Hopefully one of them might tell us something. I'm not sure. Possibly. Here's another view of the same correlation globe. Again, you can see a very dense network of correlations, which means that you really need tons of data to try to disentangle 
uh, which one of these significant nominal associations are important. Reporting standards, I think, is um, really useful to try to improve the reporting of research. Uh, by reporting standards, I don't mean that we should enforce people to do research in a particular way and uh, abandon or abolish or uh, outlaw specific types of designs. I'm just saying that there should be transparency on what was done. A design may be the first time it has been applied, even more so, I think it's essential to describe how it was applied. So there's many such efforts. Um, these are some recent efforts in molecular epidemiology, the extension of the strobe statement that covered observational research. This is the GRIP statement for genetic risk prediction studies, and there's many others. Uh, you can take a look at the Equator site uh, that uh, is an umbrella under which you will see lots of uh, reporting guideline efforts. Register and publish. Ideally, everything, but also not just publish, but also register. Um, I think one of the best ideas in clinical research has been the registration of clinical trials, and uh, um, NLM and um, Deborah Zarin have done tremendous work to try to promote that. I think that still we are scratching the surface of what registration means. So to, to give you an example, um, recently I published that paper which had been rejected, uh, I don't know, seven or eight times. I tried, I think, every single major journal. The message is pretty simple. What we found is that only about 20% of the randomized trials, 25% of the randomized trials on um, H1N1 have been published. And many of them have been delayed. Uh, all of them that have not been published are pretty much completed because these are trials that are very uh, quick to run within a few months. You're just testing uh, immune response. So am I claiming that um, uh, the negative trials have found uh, bad results about the vaccine and there's a conspiracy theory and uh, that's why they're not? No. No way. I think that they have found probably positive results but nobody cares to publish them any longer. What I'm plotting here is the impact factor of the journals where these studies were published. More or less all of these studies were of equal quality, but if you could get it published in October 2009, it would appear with an impact factor of 50. By early 2010, uh, you would go down to 30. By mid-2010, you would publish close to 10. By late 2010, you were down to three. And uh, in mid-2011, these poor people had to publish two trials in the same paper with impact factor of 1.5, two at the price of one. And obviously, the others are probably not going to be published or will have lots of difficulty to be published. Now, why was the paper rejected? Because the reviewers, there was always a reviewer saying, randomized trials should just be known by the sponsors, that means the industry, and maybe they can be also be communicated to experts and the WHO at best. And that would be sufficient. There's no need to publish that research. If the experts know, they will make the right recommendations. I have a serious problem with that. But we can discuss about it. Public availability of published research data in high-impact journals. Um, that's another empirical evaluation where we looked at the 50 most highly cited journals across different sciences, we try to see whether they have policies in place that would um, guarantee that protocols, data, and analysis would be available for public use. When you see color, that means that there are such policies. So most of these journals, they have policies. In the majority, it's about specific types of experiments. So for example, microarrays, Many, most journals have such policies. For other types of, of data and uh, designs, it's not so common. But having color, which is good news, is not necessarily the same as these numbers here. This is a very tiny font. I don't think you can read it. I cannot read it from here. But trust me, most of these numbers are zeros. And what are these zeros? It means that none of the papers that we examined to see if they followed these policies did follow these policies with few exceptions. So the policies are there, but actually um, 
much of the time they're not implemented. Which comes to the issue of repeatability. Repeatability is not replication. It's uh, just being able to repeat the calculations and see that what is reported in the paper is what you get. Uh, ideally, Bradford Hill would like to do that on the back of an envelope. And actually, I think, I don't want to misquote him, but he said that if, if something cannot be reproduced, recalculated on the back of an envelope, I cannot believe it. Uh, it has to be so simple and clear cut. Well, these are microarray experiments that we try to repeat and not on the back of an envelope. These are highly complex databases. But um, we asked the editors of Nature Genetics, and they were very generous to suggest that we could do that repeatability exercise, taking 18 papers that were covered by a policy of public availability of data, protocols, and analysis as a pre analytical codes as a prerequisite to publication. And here's what we got. Most of the time, we could not reproduce the published information at all. Sometimes we could reproduce um, in principle, but with discrepancies uh, only from process data, but not from raw data, um, or partially reproduced with discrepancies. Practically, there were only two of the 18 papers that we got the same result as was reported in the paper. And we had several teams doing that repeatability exercise independently, just to make sure that comparing notes, they would get the same result. And they did get the same result. When things could not be reproduced at all, the issue was that the databases were actually not available half of the time. Uh, the software was not available. It was a homemade version that had disappeared in the meanwhile. The methods were unclear, or the methods seemed to be very clear, but different repeating teams got a completely different result. So this is what I would think is the best journal, uh, the most transparent journal, the most advanced in having that policy, and still um, the best scientists publishing these studies. I'm not saying that these studies are wrong. I'm just saying that some very decent scientists could not really repeat them. And I have to add that these scientists who tried to repeat them, they spent sometimes more than two months trying to repeat a single table from that published paper, and they just couldn't get it. There's plenty of room for improving validation practices in omics research. Um, I think that um, we have to find ways to reward repeatability, reproducibility, and replication. Uh, until now, there's really no reward for going back and rechecking calculations and seeing that someone got the same result. Everybody would think that that's a waste of time. But sometimes that effort is really worth it. If you take Keith Baggerly, for example, and his effort to try to find out what had happened with the molecular signatures that subsequently were found to be false, and that led to three clinical trials at Duke being uh, uh, suspended and, and a whole crash of clinical research. Um, that effort took years. I, I know that Keith spent years trying to go through a few papers. If we try to do that without any um, reward, without any uh, incentive, and perhaps without any disincentive to publishing results that are not reproducible, probably it's not going to be feasible. So we need to think about rewards for repeatability and penalties potentially for non-repeatability for non -repeatability and non-reproducibility. And you can think of those happening at many different levels, at the level of analytic validity, repeatability, as I showed you, replication, external validation, clinical validity, and clinical utility. Each one of these steps has to be rechecked one way or another. How could we do that? Well, um, maybe it's all about money. I don't know. I, I hope it's not all about money. But obviously, funding mechanisms would be important to consider in order to promote reproducibility and maybe penalize non-reproducibility. Uh, the way that uh, research is funded currently, as I wrote in a, a paper in uh, uh, Nature um, a few months ago, probably we don't get what we really want to get. Uh, when I wrote that paper, it had two parts. In the first part, I was trying to argue that not everything is perfect in the funding system and the way that we appraise research. And I had to be very cautious and very polite um, 
And then the editors came back and said, no, don't waste any time on that. We know that the funding system and research is completely broken. Uh, so just start, it's broken, and just say what we can do to fix it. And there's, there's many ways that one could think about fixing the process, but maybe trying to move away from the requirement to make big promises. Um, you need to show that you're innovative. You need to show that you, what you do is important, that is original, that it's breaking new ground. Very little of what we do will be so lucky to break completely new ground. I'm, I'm very confident that 99.9% all of my papers will have disappeared within a few years. I don't know, maybe some will survive a little longer. So promising that we will make huge discoveries and building all the appraisal of science on the promise of making big, big discoveries may be unrealistic. Maybe we should promise instead that we will try to do our best. We should try to find errors, we should try to find our own errors and our own mistakes. And if we do that, probably we've done well enough. I would like to close just with uh, some special thanks to just a few people. Um, it's very difficult to list uh, about 2,000 people with whom I have co-authored papers, and uh, I'm sure that I have mil misled uh, all of them. Uh, but at least I think that uh, um, this a list of uh, people have been very influential in the work that I showed you. Thank you. We, um, we have time for questions. There are two microphones at the middle of the rooms. If you'd like to ask questions, we ask that you line up. And Dr. Ioannidis will, will take your questions in turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering whether you've had a chance to look at whether the consort guidelines have made a change in, in uh, the biases and qualities that you see? Um, and if not, why that might be the case? There's uh, several empirical evaluations that have um, assessed randomized trials before concert and after concert. And there's uh, also a number of studies that have started appearing trying to see the impact of other reporting guidelines like STARD, um, I think that there's a few efforts also to see whether strobe has made a difference. Um, summarizing the literature, I think, I hope I'm not misquoting the summary, there is improvement in many of the items in these checklists. However, there are some caveats. Um, first of all, it's very difficult to say that there is a, a cause and effect relationship because uh, many other things are happening at the same time. So I think it's precarious to say that it's the reporting guidelines that did make a difference and there's so many other things happening in the research environment uh, concurrently. Second, um, there, there may be some uh, effect of trying to be nice uh, once you have a list of reporting that people have to adhere to. Uh, meaning that um, if you're forced by the journal, by the editors, to adhere to a list, many investigators will just say something so that they can check that I did that and I report that. But this does not necessarily mean that it was done the way that it should have been done. So, so th th there may be uh, an artificial um, effect of um, promoting politically correct reporting, but I'm not sure that necessarily means that what was done was equally correct. So I, I, I I'm not sure that it's easy to differentiate between politically correct and correct. John, uh, very provocative as uh, always. Uh, so just a couple of comments. One, uh, just to clarify for the audience, because you know, the winner's curse is not a curse for the winner. The winner publishes paper in a high impact factor journal. The winner's curse is the problem for the rest of us who actually believe it in the absence of all those other data. I actually think you're being way too kind on both scientists and on, the, on, on the, the journals themselves. So I think part of the problem of the lost data are the data that never even get to the point where they can be lost. So some of this is the file draw phenomena, but as we discussed when we wrote the winner's course, if you have an expensive uh, project, clinical work aside for the moment because of clinicaltrials.gov and other registrations, if you're doing experiments and they're not coming out the way a published paper 
would make it seem that they have to come out. It's not only that you have negative data, you stop doing the experiments. So that we, we don't have time to pursue negative data in the laboratory and often in the clinic. So trials are stopped, experiments are stopped. So that unknown, that's the, you know, the famous Rumsfeld unknown unknowns, we don't know how those experiments uh, would have worked out. The second point, I guess, is that these meta-analyses, you're using them very effectively, but they often are used to describe, because the numbers are higher, a more potent effect than is seen in any of the individual ones. And if the meta-analyses are based on faulty data, then you just have a better statistic at the end because you've looked at thousands instead of uh, hundreds of patients, uh, hundreds of, uh, of samples. And I also think, you know, on the scientist and on the publication part, that there's a, an area that we have really not adequately explored. I'm going to just finish the Daniel Kahneman's book on the way people think, you know, the system one, system two, for those of you who have read that. There's no real reason to think that scientists have somehow avoided all the biases that normal human beings, to the extent that we are normal human beings, have in terms of the, what we want in life, what the data are supposed to look like, where we want to publish. Um, so I think the scientists are highly, highly prone to bias in many, many respects. And I think the journals whose job should be to get rid of as much bias, they have their own set of biases, as you very eloquently pointed out. It has to be significant, it has to be novel. No way that they actually know that. No way that they actually know that. They have no way of predicting what's really going to be significant or innovative in the future. And I think even in these simple points like, will you publish a paper in clinical work, for example, that is unregistered? Will you publish a paper without actually seeing the protocol and all its amendments? A minority of journals will actually perform that. They'll actually screen to see whether the trials are, uh, are in fact registered, whether the protocol has been adhered to, whether the primary endpoints are those that are actually being reported as to, uh, as, to as you mentioned, the uh, data mining. And on the other side, the premier journals will ask you for information to jazz up your article. So you've got a clinical result. It's striking. It's a clinical result. You've done your study. You've completed it. But the journal, journals like the New England Journal or JAMA will say, well, did you actually look to see whether there's a, a, a correlate in the laboratory? They'll ask you to go back and actually do those experiments so they can now present a mechanism, not even an association, but a mechanism. So I think that, uh, unfortunately, like Kahneman would, as Kahneman would say, you're preaching to people who will listen to you that I that's me, but it's also others, you preach to the journals, and then they go back and do exactly what they've been doing up until then. And I don't know that we have, uh, that we can even conceive of an incentive structure, because in the end it is going to have to be an incentive structure that will reward people who do this dirty work of trying to reproduce uh, papers. That's, that, that is not a good, that's not good advice to give to a postdoc to spend your career doing that, and to punish people um, uh, without this, uh, this excuse that science is self-correcting and I did my experiment and the fact that somebody got something different. In the meantime, I got my promotion, I got my high impact factor journal uh, article. So I'm actually, I'm actually quite pessimistic about you know, much of this, even though science generates terrific stuff. It may be the best of the alternatives we have. I mean, after all, uh, people working in evolution presumably make the same mistakes that you described. It's still better than creationism. Uh, and it may be a matter of our figuring out what the, what the right norm is. Well, this is important. I mean, you published an article some years ago where whatever the number was, how many papers that had promised a, uh, a clinical result, Clini something, uh, the uh, uh, JAMA, some, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll mention it when you respond, and only a very minor percent of them, a few, four or five percent actually ended up in clinical trials, only a couple percent ended up in a, in a drug, and maybe one was really a really good drug. And you and I argued about that. Maybe that's a good number. Maybe one out of a hundred of a successful drug coming out of pretty close to preclinical pre data, as you said at the end, maybe that's the number we should accept. We should tell the journalists who interview us that we're probably wrong when we do our mouse model or a tissue culture experiment, but that may be a perfectly acceptable number. We don't have another norm, we just have a way of describing it. Anyway, congratulations on a lovely talk. Thank you, Neil. I, I think we're pretty much on the same wavelength for, for all of these points, and uh, I, I could not agree more that, that you need a change in the, in the incentive structure and, and, and a paradigm shift on how people view reproducibility research and, and what do they expect uh, from science. You know, as you say, one, one in a hundred yield for many scientific fields should be extremely nice and uh, people should be very happy for that. But I, I think that there will be a reality check sooner or later and there is reality checks happening. Um, I, it, it may eventually happen for the wrong reason. I, I don't know what that reason might be. It could be financial constraints. It could be uh, other forces that are outside science that unless we make a more convincing case that uh, 
we're doing something in order to maximize the chances of getting to the truth, but truth is very difficult to arrive at. If we sell quote-unquote truths right and left and they get refuted, I, I think our prestige as scientists is, is going to dissipate very quickly. Thank you very much for a, a great, concise summary of a really long series of important papers. Um, there's, there's a movement now for comparative effectiveness research where a uh, lot of definitions, but the essence is comparing A to B rather than A to a placebo or uh, to usual care. Uh, have you been involved in or do you have advice for people uh, uh, working on methods of comparative effectiveness research? Uh, different from or, or extending what uh, what we should be doing in RCTs and observational studies. So th this is a this is a huge topic and, and a very important one, and I don't want to uh, treat it uh, with some uh, uh, one sentence quote <laughs> because it, it would be unfair. I, I think under the umbrella of comparative effectiveness research, there's many different initiatives. Uh, uh, on, on one side you have randomized trials, you could include them under comparative effectiveness research, or you can think of uh, meta-analysis of multiple comparisons, network meta-analysis also being comparative effectiveness research. And then you have a big cluster of observational designs uh, with different efforts to adjust with propensity or instrumental variables and, and try to come as close as possible to an unbiased comparison between different uh, treatments. So. The, the very short um, description of, of what I believe is that this is very useful research, but we still don't know its operational characteristics. So we, we, we don't know what its replication potential is. Um, most of the time, and currently I'm looking at a large sample of about 500 studies that have used propensity adjustments. Most of the times you see that these investigators are starting making a claim that they have done something different that has not done, been done before. They have looked at, looked at an outcome that has not been studied, a comparison that has not been studied, a population that has not been studied, a subset that no one has touched. If you look more carefully, I'm actually a little disappointed that that uniqueness is not so unique. So, so people have not taken that really bold step to test something that we don't have any other evidence uh, on. Uh, it, it, it seems like just nimble steps of fine-tuning on, on a sub-question that we have some pretty good evidence on the main question uh, and an answer. Uh, so I, I think we need more bold research in comparative effectiveness, test really lots of treatments, all the treatments in specific conditions, because in many conditions currently we just have dozens of options to use, um, many large-scale studies and many um, juxtapositions and replication efforts to see how close we get in these results. And what do they really tell us? Most of the results that I see from such papers, they seem reasonable, but so what? I mean, they, they say that here's a comparative effectiveness research based on electronic records, on statins for that subset, subgroup of people, and we see that mortality decreased by 35%. Uh, that's what we have seen also in other studies, randomized trials, not exactly for that subtype, but it's something that I would expect more or less. So I think we need more, more bold comparative effectiveness research and, and a stronger application record on the bold questions, not the ones that you can predict largely what you would get. Do, do, you, do you want to go over there, perhaps? Yeah. So, I, thanks, John. This is a very, very nice talk, very provocative. I have one comment and one question. Uh, <clears throat> one, the comment really, it also plays to, uh, to, to Neil's point. Uh, we've, we've published a number of studies at NHLBI in the last couple of years which have, uh, they're negative studies, they, they prove the lack of effectiveness of, of therapies that people are very fond of. Uh, and fortunately because they're big studies, we've actually been able to get them in very high impact journals. But then I spend the next couple of years getting raked over the coals because people don't like one aspect of the design or another. And the truth is that if you, manipulated the design, you still wouldn't find a, different, a result that's in any way different. Uh, and so I think the, the issue of bias for scientists is a, is a very important one, uh, not just for the investigators, but for the population as a whole, uh, in, in the sense that 
when we find something that people don't want to believe, they promptly continue to not believe it. It doesn't actually make any difference, and, and they don't bother looking at, at, uh, at what, the, what the result is because it isn't what they wanted to see. The other is that we're struggling, uh, and it sort of comes to your peer review uh, question, with trying to figure out how to support high-impact clinical research. Uh, what tends to do well in peer review are studies that are particularly well designed, that are likely to answer the question, or that are uh, <clears throat> that are uh, that are sufficiently well focused to be able to be successfully done. But what we're finding is that a very very large number of those answer trivial questions uh, that are not really particularly important. These are very expensive studies, and so we're putting a fair amount of effort right now into trying to figure out how to. Uh, not actually necessarily have people be more innovative or more creative, but, but really to sort of raise the discussion so that they're asking questions that will be clinically significant and not just statistically significant. And we're finding it extremely difficult to do. Uh, because I, maybe in part because people can't agree on what is, it's easier to agree on what is statistically significant than on what is clinically significant. But uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about how to do that. We're uh, so, sort of starting to crowdsource to try to get some ideas for that. Um, but we don't think we're going to get them through standard peer review. I, I think that this is a very uh, interesting comment. And um, I, I agree that it's, um, it's not so common to see um, efforts at creating studies that are clinically very important and uh, you know they're they're going to give definitive answers on on crucial questions um, probably the main limitation is that you need very large sample sizes for such studies and uh, commitment of effort over many years to to get these answers uh, we have many shortcuts and some of them may work others may not work I, I think that there has been a debate about surrogate endpoints for example for over 20 years now um, I have always felt that we need some classic, um, you know, old-fashioned perhaps, large randomized trials on important questions with hard clinical outcomes in, in, in many different fields. And um, I, I think that that opportunity has not been lost. I, I think the investment in such efforts would be definitely worth it in, in the long term because we, we would be able to give answers that would pertain to hundreds of or even thousands of other studies that might have been done and you know maybe there was no need to do them or at least we would have uh, we would be able to shift them to a different direction so I'm, I'm very much in favor of um, uh, decisive large-scale uh, evidence on important questions uh, excuse me I'm just curious I'm a pathologist by training and I, when I see these biomarker studies, I always get interested in them because we always hear about them in the lab. And I, I've come to sort of a, I think I, I have a bit of an idea as to why they start to fail later. And that is, is that the human organism tends to make the same uh, changes biochemically across a wide variety of illnesses. And so you tend to um, make the same sets of, you tend to change the same set of acute phase proteins and stress proteins. And I suspect that a lot of these studies, uh, as after the initial report, upon further analysis, basically that phenomenon became apparent. And uh, people were seeing more and more groups of people with other diseases uh, that were positive with a test that was originally reported to be positive against just one. And that a possible way of addressing this type of phenomena, if it is if you think it exists, or if we could tell it exists, is by simply requiring people to put in more complex diseased patients to the control groups before they report out that this is specific for a disease. I, I think that um, uh, this is an interesting point. It, it, it raises the issue of, of how we search for biomarkers. Uh, and most of the time, we, we run studies that are unrealistic. Uh, in terms of what they compare. So uh, the, the comparison is something that is not going to be relevant for clinical practice because most of the time you don't have controls that you have ascertained that they have absolutely no problem versus uh, diseased people. Uh, you have a mix of symptoms or signs and, and uncertainty about what the condition is that you want to 
find a biomarker to make a diagnosis. And clearly the, the discriminating ability for discriminating conditions that are more related would be less compared to the discriminating ability of uh, extreme cases versus completely ascertained healthy controls. Um, I, I would argue that maybe that same principle of massive testing could be applied to biomarkers as well. So instead of testing one biomarker at a time, you can think of testing hundreds and thousands of biomarkers across dozens and hundreds of conditions and, and have a, a big matrix of uh, associations that you can analyze as a whole and then see what is really the strongest signals here and which ones are the ones that I want to take to the next step for further validation and, and see whether they replicate well and they apply in different circumstances. Um, I, I think that some fields are moving in that direction, not, not a lot. I mean, most of biomarker research is still the typical case control or cohort study, one or a few biomarkers, and I, I don't see that getting anywhere. I mean, most of these effects are likely to be small or tiny, and in isolation, they're not going to be useful. If we have lots of them, hundreds, thousands, maybe their composite will start telling us something and, and also tell us about many diseases. Almost all of your examples were from fields of epidemiology, which has had a 50-year uh, tradition of statistical thinking and testing of hypotheses. But more and more of biomedical research is now based upon animal models of disease and animal models of therapy. And this is a field which has had much less of a tradition in statistical analyses or even in agreeing on protocols. For example, it's not uncommon for research protocols to be continuously changed during the course of research. And uh, there's no agreement on numbers of animals or, uh, or the homogeneity of the animals necessary for uh, establishing uh, uh, effects and effect sizes. And I'm wondering whether you've thought about or looked at the literature of the animal model aspects, which is a very, very large part, especially of NIH funded, but even now a pharmaceutical company funded research and how your concepts apply to that body of literature? Animal models. Um, I, I had evaded <laughs> touching <laughs> that area, uh, first of all, because I, I felt completely unqualified in, in the the basic science uh, behind them. But uh, obviously, I, I just kept seeing more and more such studies in very prestigious venues, and, and they caught my attention. And I realized that other people's attention has been caught as well. Um, Malcolm McLeod has done some excellent work on uh, animal studies, experimental animal studies, and has published a number of uh, very nice papers in PLOS Biology and Stroke uh, and other journals clearly showing that there's huge problems with biases in, in these studies. Um, actually, I've started collaborating with him. Um, we are running an analysis with excess significance testing on a few thousand of, uh, of such studies. And uh, preliminarily, it looks horrible. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it looks actually so bad that, uh, you know, probably what I showed you here is uh, is really at a, at a much better condition. Um, why is that? I, I, I think it's probably expected. You have small studies. Uh, most of those are, you know, five, ten animals. Uh, even if, if they're randomized, you have five or ten animals in one group and five or ten in the other. Um, you have lots of flexibility in what is to be reported. And as you say, uh, statistics have not made uh, such an imprint in, in that field. Um, sometimes I, I talk with some colleagues who are more on, on the wet lab side, and they tell me, well, in my field we use no statistics, so we're safe. And, <laughs> and I, I, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> I think that uh, maybe, you know, this is like the, you know, the pre-statistical stage, which is, uh, you know, closer to the cave age in terms of uh, where science is. But um, I don't know. I, I, I'd like to see some more empirical evidence on, on pre-statistical fields. 
I'm Chris Berg. I'm co-PI of a large prospective randomized clinical trial called the National Lung Screening Trial, published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. It is a sample size of 53,454 individuals, uh, shows a 20 percent uh, reduction in lung cancer-specific mortality in a very high-risk group. It's as definitive as you can get. Should it, in my opinion, <laughs> so A, should it be accepted now, and uh, should individuals who meet the entry criteria go forward and get screened? Or should it uh, be reproduced? Um, 53,000, and how many people had an event? Uh, we had 1,600 uh, lung cancers. You should be familiar with the study. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't, <laughs> don't uh, recall the, the exact number. So with, with 1,600, um, I think you're pretty safe. I mean, I, I, I'm not so overwhelmed by the, the 53,000 as by the 1,600. Mm -hmm. So uh, the plot that I showed you that showed the effect uh, inflation by 1.8-fold, uh, that pertained to studies that had effective sample size, number of events less than 40. Once you get uh, to number of events above 500, the, and, and these are hard clinical outcomes, not just you know, subjectively ascertained uh, surrogate outcomes, the effects in well-designed trials tend to be pretty stable. The, the problem is that we don't have the benefit of having such trials in many fields. So I, I would think that the next amount of money probably should go to another field that is still playing with 10 and 20 and 12 and 5 and, you know, and animal studies or, or, or clinical studies with 10 people. Um, okay. I do not think anyone's going to reproduce this particular study. <laughs> it, it cost $256 million and took yeah, over 10 I, years. I'm sure. <laughs> yes. So, um, just talking about the alternative mechanisms to promote the truth in biomedical research, uh, Nancy Canwisher had an interesting comment the other day I read, uh, talking about neuroimaging. She suggested a sort of a futures market on the replicability of results. So, this, this kind of three steps. First, uh, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. So, some institute would take findings from the literature and choose a subset of them and say, oh, we're going to replicate some, some amount of these in the future. The second step is that scientists could either bet either money or reputation on whether they thought that that result would replicate. And the third step is that the institute would then award grants to independent researchers to go back and actually redo the study and see whether it does replicate. So the advantages is that you get quantitative estimates of how likely something is to be true, and you get incentives for researchers to uh, actually have replicable results. So I wondered if you have any thoughts on that idea, because I thought it was really interesting when I read it. Yeah, I, I think these are interesting ideas. I, I, I think in terms of how to administer the uh, replicability or repeatability agenda, I'm completely open to suggestions. Uh, some of those I have put forth uh, also myself, uh, very similar actually to, to what you described. Um, so one option, because obviously you cannot repeat everything, is to maybe target uh, those discoveries or scientific findings that reach a threshold of starting being considered for applicability. So you have uh, lots of microarray research and people are playing and having uh, a great time generating very nice results, but nobody wants to use them. I don't care, let's continue like that. I, w I would wonder whether we should continue. If we have money to spend, that's okay. But now someone says, I want to use a molecular signature to uh, randomize patients. So, and I'm, I'm willing to take that to the next step. If it works in the randomized trial, then it, it may be used in practice as well. Then I would argue that maybe for that, which is the exception, the agenda of the body of evidence that has been, repl that that has been produced until that point could be um, given to replicators to replicate. So you can have a team of uh, bioinformaticians or biostatisticians and to ask them, can you repeat these analyses from the 10 studies that were published in Nature Medicine, uh, Nature Genetics, Nature Science, I don't know, uh, Journal of Clinical Investigation, and tell me that you get the same results. This is a very targeted repeatability exercise done for only something that is planning to move to an application, clinical applicability threshold. The, the second possibility is to, is to try to allocate uh, a portion of the funding to people who just do reproducibility research. 
And um, I, I, I would find that that would be a very good idea because uh, even if you can uh, allocate 1% of the funding in that direction, you may get really uh, tremendous benefit uh, because y you will start seeing uh, in a more systematic fashion and not just haphazard what happens to be done uh, in, in large bodies of evidence uh, how much the results are applicable. So, but I don't control the money. <laughs> Uh, John, I, I want to ask a question about your uh, attitude toward uh, the, it's, it's a sort of an exchangeability question. Uh, when, when you summarize the results of many studies uh, that you present to us and, and comment on the heterogeneity of the results uh, and so on like that, it's very difficult to believe that all those studies really were trying to test exactly the same hypothesis. Uh, in fact, uh, probably most of the investigators who were doing those studies saying that were, were, were starting from the premise that they were addressing a very specific, unique question, not the same question as all those other studies were. So, uh, so I guess my question to you is, do you have this sort of uh, instinctive notion, intuitive notion, that we are uh, paying a lot more attention to the potential variation of results than we ought to be. That in fact, if vitamin C is going to have benefits, it should be expressed in a whole range of, of clinical situations so that it's reasonable to anticipate that if there's a real effect, it's going to be very nearly the same real effect across all of those contexts. Uh, because if you're not, if, if that's not your position, then, then I'm not so sure that I'm interested in the, the kind of variability that occurs in the meta-analysis of, of dozens and dozens of studies. Dennis, I, I think that that's uh, really a, a very legitimate concern. Um, Exchangeability is something that uh, you have to uh, assume at best. There's no guarantee that there is exchangeability. And it's always very difficult to differentiate genuine diversity, genuine heterogeneity from uh, heterogeneity that's due to bias. Um, I think that some fields have such patterns that are very consistent with a picture that bias is the main player that drives the heterogeneity. But I, I'm not sure that one would be safe to say that that's always the case. I would argue that it's important to get rid of the noise of the bias in order to start seeing whatever diversity there exists in, in real effects and, and start to making some real use of that. Uh, but in the current situation, I know very little field, very hardly any field that, that really you can easily get rid of the bias and start seeing the heterogeneity very nicely because of uh, of, of different responses in different populations or different settings. That, that would be the ideal. And I, I think that if, if we cut back on the noise, we'll start seeing more of these signals. Um, I, I think that um, even if the effects are different, which I believe that they must be to some extent, there would be no reason to see that clustering of efforts to uh, really pass specific thresholds of significance. I mean, if, if, if they were just genuinely different. In fact, sometimes uh, they would move more to the right, more to the left. There would be no reason why everybody would be lined on trying to pass the threshold of significance. Uh, so I, when I see that pattern again and again, I, I worry that it's mostly the noise that we see and not the benefit of, of discerning differences in effect sizes. Thank you. This was a great lecture. We really enjoyed uh, your uh, take on these issues, and I especially appreciated the input from the audience and the questions. This clearly struck a chord with people, John, and I'm grateful that you did that. Thank you. Um, I want to thank, uh, in particular, the uh, co-sponsors of this lecture uh, with us, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and the National Cancer Institute's Division of Cancer Prevention for co-sponsoring this. I welcome all of you to come to our next lecture in this series on the 
uh, 17th of May, where Scott Richardson will explore uh, how to close the evidence to practice gap through teaching evidence-based medicine in medical schools. In the meantime, again, thank you very much, John. Thank you. Cheers.